If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. We're glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and a variety of other platforms. Here on The New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as community, research, careers, and COVID-19. We're happy you're listening. My guest today is Mr. Ricardo DeVoe the Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Education in the Bahamas. Thanks again for joining me. Just briefly, I'll inform my audience about you. An accomplished scholar and public servant, Mr. Ricardo DeVoe is a 1985 graduate of the Aaron Bailey Senior High School, a 1990 graduate of Bethune Cookman College with a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology with honors, and a 1992 graduate of Nova Southeastern University with a Master's of Science degree in Human Services with a specialization in Human Resource Management. In May 2009, he delivered the commencement address at Bethune Cookman University and was awarded the Honorary Doctorate of Humane Letters. He's been employed with the Bahamas government since 1992, and he is currently stationed at the Ministry of Education as Deputy Permanent Secretary, responsible for the technical education and labor relations. He is the former chairman of the school board for Arm Bailey Senior High School, former chairman for Greenville Preparatory Academy, and a member of the National Tripartite Council. He is the former student body president at Bethune Cookman University and resident student body president at Nova Southeastern University. He's won numerous awards and has numerous accomplishments. And he was instrumental in the establishment of the Bahamas Primary School Student of the Year Awards Program, a premier awards program in the Bahamas. It is good to have him on as a guest. Please welcome Mr. Ricardo. DeVoe. Thank you, Mr. DeVoe, for joining me today. It is a pleasure, a privilege, or honor to have the Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Education on this podcast today. Um, thank you again. Thank so, you for having me. Yes. So what have been your long-standing interests in the field of public service? Um. You know, I started as a public service servant 29 years ago, and there were many reasons, um, you know, people joined the public service. You know, one is economic opportunity, the chance to work on something that they're passionate about, and most persons join the public service because of job security. But for me, it honestly, I felt like for the past 29 years, I've been a part of a group of individuals who are determined to change the profile of the public servant raising the profile of the who the public servant is mm. um, and also um, giving the example that the best and brightest individuals still want to work for um, the government, people who are committed to making a difference. And I know for me, um, I joined the public service because I want to give back to my country. Mm -hmm. I want to give back. So <laughs> that has been um, my longstanding interest in the field of um in the field of public service giving okay. back giving back so reciprocity yeah. basically what yeah. you receive you want to give yes. back in return so yes. how do you see yourself doing that how are you do you feel like you're doing that now well i am um well as um well in the public service we have i i started i started in 1992 once i came back from grad school and it's interesting because persons usually think, well, okay, you're working at, um, like I have 
working at the Ministry of Education now. However, I started working um, at the Ministry of, um, I started with the Ministry of Education in 1992. I've been working there since um, 92 to 98. And then I went on a rotation where I worked at the Ministry of Finance for five, I was on a rotation for 15 months, Ministry of Finance for um, five months, Ministry of Public Works for five months. Then I worked in the actual cabinet office for five months. They had, um, we were uh, up and coming public servants. So they wanted to give us a feel of how the, the public service was. And then I got seconded to the Royal Bahamas Police Force to work in the Human Resources Department for two years. And then after that, I went to the Ministry of Housing, where I worked for um, about four, four years. And then I went to Ministry of Youth, where I assisted in starting a small business uh, program called Self Starter, where we assisted young entrepreneurs um, to get funding to start their own business. And then after that, we, um, I went to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for one year. And um, from 2013 to um, September of this year, I was at the Ministry of Labor, where again, working in, the, in, in public service in the field of assisting in labor relations. And in September of this year, I got transferred back to the Ministry of Education. So it's almost like I'm back home where mm -hmm. I started 29 years ago. But every position that I've had in the public service is all about giving back, about assisting, about um, me growing as an individual. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Yeah, I think it's very important for us um, to not only achieve things, but be able to help others to achieve as well. So yes. in terms of your... In terms of your yeah, yeah no. in terms of your um, career thus far, you have served as deputy permanent secretary, assistant secretary um, at, in the cabinet office, as you mentioned, in the Ministry of Youth. But also one thing that stands out is you were active in student government. So what, where, where would you say this leadership capacity or desire, where do you say, where would you say that came from? How do you, well, say, how was that developed? <laughs> well, interesting. Um, um, in both of my college, my undergrad and grad, I was student body president. And so uh, my love for service began even, I guess in high school, cause I was a part of junior achievement um, so I was president of my junior achievement company. Uh, when I went to uh, college, I was on student government from my sophomore year. So I've always, service has always been a part of um, what I enjoy doing. So I, I believe coming to the public service and serving was just another form of, uh, of being able to be comfortable and excited about giving back uh, to my community, giving back to my country. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So, how do you maintain view of the bigger picture in your career and in your life in general? <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Um, I think many years ago, um, I don't know if you would you would hear, but, but people would say that well, well, the public servants don't have, attract the best and the brightest, um, and so I I have said for me that the public service, um, um, what, what has caught my attention, I guess, with the public service is that public service, uh, and that's why I say that the career in public service is something that you have to want to give back. Because in the public service, and we think about the private sector, in the public, in the private sector is usually that you're accountable to who your shareholders, you're accountable to, um, to those persons who, um, and it's all about a profit driven. But when you work for the public service, um, you don't aren't afforded that luxury. You are now working to make um, taxpayers or who are your customers, they're the ones who are demanding. And so uh, it ain't, we don't have no um, shareholders that we say we have to make a profit. So my bigger picture of working in the career in public service, meaning that 
I'm going to be obligated to these uh, to these taxpayers that I'm going to give the best quality service that I'm supposed to give. I'm going to give back um, um, and ensure that whatever section that I'm in, that I'm going to be a part of those change agents that are making the government look good. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's yeah. I, I look at that as, for me, the bigger picture. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I completely agree. It's almost, it's, you're striving for excellence within your field, within your craft. Yes. You maximize the resources that are available to you as a public servant. So yes. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and you know, with that same uh, intention to give back, that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast. That's one of the reasons why I have decided to start writing books as well as a chemistry graduate student. I've published a book already and I'm working on some more books. I'm trying to tailor a book right now for BGCSC chemistry students at this moment. Wow. Let me tell you, can I, can I be a little honest about you? I mean, when I met you as a sixth grade student, mm -hmm. um, I would always remember the portfolio that you presented. Okay. The student of the year. Okay. Um, you were about 10 or 11 and you, you were dressed up. Um, and I remember everyone talking about you. You okay. were dressed up in, in a high chair, mm -hmm. in a suit and tie. Okay. And that was the opening picture of your portfolio. <laughs> and I, can, I, I, I always remember what the words of the judges were. It was like, this young man has already changed his mindset. We can't wait to see where he will be in years to come. And it's interesting that I look at you today and I look at that same young man in that portfolio. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to your portfolio, you will see you were that young man in that, that chair, in that high chair with that tie, shirt and tie, doing yeah. great things, my brother. Doing great Thank things. you. Yeah, God is good. God is good. And I'm thankful for my parents and people like you who saw potential <laughs> in me to invest in that potential and to give back to me. So, yeah, thank you so much. So how have you been adaptive and creative in the field of education? You know, currently um, we, we encounter some challenges in the Bahamas. Yeah, yes. We are encountering some challenges. I think everyone's aware of that. So how are we like are being adaptive or creative? What new technologies, new strategies are we implementing to improve it? Well, I guess one of the things um, that we have um, in the last 19, 20 months, uh, especially in the field of education, we have really truly been, um, as a Ministry of Education, uh, suffering because, I mean, this pandemic has uh, created, a, a, I guess, a headache for all of us. And, and in fact, just in the last four weeks, the Ministry of Education has been in a lot of meetings. In fact, we just had a town hall meeting on Thursday with our minister, the Honorable Glenisana Martin, mm -hmm. is that you know, we have had the virtual platform in education um, and, and there have been some challenges because unlike, I guess, students who are probably in the private school, so parents are investing, we have a lot of kids who are not being properly or have not been coming on. So we are having to find like creative ways of how we're going to um, get these kids back to the level where at least trying to catch them up. Well. We have now had to, uh, in January, start this hybrid model of kids going back to school mm -hmm. um, because uh, we are giving kids the, the tools. We're giving them the, um, I, the technology. Uh, technology needed. However, we're still seeing, uh, we're seeing, we're seeing about, at least they're saying about 40% of the kids who have not been on um, since this virtual began. And so that's a problem for us. Yeah. That and, is so problem. We, um, and so we are really honestly trying to see how we're going to get these kids back into some school. And, and of course, uh, prior to the pandemic, we had kids who were falling behind mm -hmm. in the system. So um, 20 months, uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are working and praying and hoping because um, the United Nations has said that um, if we don't correct this problem soon, we will lose a generation and, and we can't afford to lose that. And so the Ministry of Education is doing all it can to ensure that we don't lose a generation here in the Bahamas. We can't afford to do it. Yeah, we can't afford to do that. And you know, I completely 
I'll say this, you know, I, I'm a person of faith, so I believe things can change. Yes, yes, and yeah. we are we are too, and that's what the minister said last week. She says, yeah. you know, we are praying that this is not the case. So yeah. we are, yeah. we are, yeah. we are praying. Yeah, we faith are, and we are believing. We faith are believing. and strategy. Faith yes. and strategy. So you yes. know, and along with that same line, I'll drop one more, one more update. Um, I, I've also work, I'm also working towards a specific uh, tailored grant, um, to oh. help support uh labs back home in the bahamas if the grant okay. is approved if the grant okay, is approved awesome. Awesome. yeah i'm working towards that as well so and you know because at the same time i agree and i acknowledge that government plays a major role in changing things but we the people have to play a role as well yes to complement to changing the dynamic as well so yeah that's what i'm working on as well so how have you sort of found the right environment for you to thrive scientifically and intellectually how did you know which environment was for you at that particular season and time? Well, it's interesting because I've been um, um, an individual who have been prayerful about decisions and things that I uh, will do in my life. And interesting enough, it it is so weird because I have been I've been in the season. I was at the Ministry of Labor for seven years and. I knew that it was really time for me to move on. And so I started saying, well, Lord, um, where, where is my next season? Um, and so I started um, asking for directions. I did not know that I would end up back at the Ministry of Education. I, I, I thought that was a shock when I got a call to say that I'm, I'm being transferred to education. And um, it was, it was um, in July of this year that I got the call and I end up going back to education in September. But then I realized um, God is, is, is directing my life. And so if, I, if he's directing me, there's something why I went back to education. And of course, I guess we will talk about the impactful program that I have that's not a government funded program, that's something that's private. Mm -hmm. However, I think that God saw, well, hey, um, he's doing something in education, mm -hmm. um, impacting education in his private life. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see how I can send him to, to do that work in addition to being at the Ministry of Education. And, and so I, I think it's, it's, it's been something looked at complementary. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't, I mean, honestly, I was like, no, I don't want to go to education. And they get confused that this program that I had that's private is, is a part of education, but um, I'm believing God that he directs us part and he directed me to, to go back to education. Yeah. So I'm just there. And you know, as someone on the outside, I think there's a continuous trend in that you have always been working in the field of education. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I think it's a continuous trend. Yes. So, you yes. know, along the lines of talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and science education or education in general, would you say that visualizing in terms of what are the desired goals on the other side of this adversity, specifying what we can do now and collaborating? Do, would you say those three aspects are critical to us implementing change to the next phase of this educational system? Well, there's no if, answer, but I okay. think that this, the last 20 years, 20 months, sorry, has taught us that what we were doing isn't really working properly. And so, we now have to start to strategically think about how we are going to, to um, implement these changes in the field of education to improve, to make sure that we don't lose any of our, our students. And so definitely, if the last 20 months didn't teach us anything, then we would have failed as leaders. We would have failed as, as individuals who are responsible for um, making sure that the next level um, or, or the next set of persons are not disadvantaged because yeah. we did not plan, we yeah. did not see, we yeah. did not yeah. foresee. So uh, I just have one more question along these lines and then we transition to something else. Another question I have is, would you say that um, taking ownership of your learning uh, allowed for certain students to be more successful in the public school system in that teaching themselves or finding a way to learn the material themselves with the facilitation of a teacher enabled success for student outcomes? Well, well, I think 
part of it have to be um, one, it has to be a collaborative effort between parent and teachers. Um, so I, I, I think the tripod, you know, the, the government, the parent, the, the, um, and also the student, parent and student, because part of it, um, David, is that we know that students who attend um, private schools, they, their parents are usually more involved. Um, but we find out that the students who attend the public school, their parents aren't as involved, or sometimes they can't be. Mm -hmm. But we need to find some way that we will actually connect all of these dots to determining that, hey, you have to be involved in your child's life. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, I, I sort of have a perspective on that because I attended a private school and I know that I don't talk about this aspect of my life much, but I attended a private school and I got kicked out mm -hmm. of my private school. Mm -hmm. um, because I got three F's, two D's. I'd already repeated the eighth grade. And so by the 10th grade, I got kicked out mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of the private school I attended. Mm -hmm. um, my parents sought to enroll me in another private school, two other private schools, and that didn't work. So I had to attend a public school. But my parents did not give up on me when I went into that um, public school. Mm -hmm. They continued to work. I had a guidance counselor by the name of Zoe Powell. I had a teacher by the name of Sharon Poitier and a teacher by the late Chuck Mackey, who pushed me and who knew that I was a broken child and they realized that I needed intervention. Mm -hmm. And so with my parents, Edward and Beverly DeVoe and those good teachers, I am who I am today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Broken, yeah. but ma making a contribution now. Yeah, I, no, that's a good story. And that's a good narrative. And I think, you know, if we could extrapolate the, the interventions from those case studies, in those particular scenarios, I think we can implement some more changes. So yes. um, how do you maintain a balanced life given all your responsibilities and accomplishments? How do you maintain balance, <laughs> Mr. DeVoe? Well, let me tell you, I have an awesome wife, Pamela, and two amazing daughters who are partners with me in the work that I do, whatever I do. Okay. And I, I, I've also set a principle, and this may sound crazy, but I said, um, I would save the world from Monday to Thursday. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm saving my family Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And that doesn't mean that on Mondays I, I don't deal with family, but um, I'm actively involved in my community. And, um, but I'm also actively involved in my um, children's life. No school play, no school dance. I am, I am not there because I want my, my children to also know I can't be saving the whole world and not saving them. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, what you would notice that, I mean, I find um, my wife and I have, she do the school drop off, I do the pickup. And I have always enjoyed doing the pickup because I usually find that time to talk to my daughters to find out what's going on. Um, well, one is in college now and the, uh, the others in grade seven, but I enjoyed that time that I spent with them. So that was always, always a part of the balance. So although I was working hard, mm -hmm. I was like, guess what? I'm still saving. I don't plan nothing on Friday nights. Uh, so there's no parties, no nothing. I'm always at, my daughters are going, to, whatever they want to do on Friday nights and Saturday, other days, like just the Saturday. Uh, on Saturday day, my fraternity had a bell ringing for the Salvation Army. But mm -hmm. that night, um, I took my daughters to get something to eat, my wife and daughters for something to eat. Then we went um, looking at the Christmas lights and on because May I'm trying to create moments. You know, that night. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to create a moment. So that's how come I have a balanced life. Okay, you know, yeah. Because it's very important to have a balanced life. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And you know what you talk about, um, if you phrase it differently, um, you talked about strategies and priorities, yeah. basically. Yes. Yeah, yes. you have, you, and you know, I've spoken to professors from MIT, Harvard, Georgia Tech, and a variety of other places. And there are some common trends. Most of them say, most of them, when, they talk, when I ask them about um, balance, they speak about their spouses, one. Yeah. And they also speak about their family. So having yes. priorities just complement the balance. Yes. So um, how do you maintain vision and teamwork in your environment? How are you able to keep the team moving, team going forward? Well, first of all, I, you know, we were trying to connect for a while. And it was because I've uh, just a few months ago, 
the government implemented a leadership training program for nine months for, they have selected about 40 public servants to put us through this course, where we are dealing with ethics in government, where we're doing teamwork, where we're de um, doing productivity. And it's so interesting because they have brought about 40 like-minded, I, I, I guess for them, the government is saying, well, okay, these are, these are a group of part of our, um, the leaders, the movers, the shakers, the ones who are going to be transformative. And it's so interesting is that we are feeding off one another because then we realize that, hey, we are, we are going to be a part of the individuals who are going to make a difference in the public service. And so um, maintaining vision and teamwork mm -hmm. in that environment, we are, we are feeding off one another. And although we are from respective ministries, we find that there's some common threads of things that we need to do, some things that we need to, how we are going to implement um, the public service. We know that we have to change the mindset mm -hmm. of the public servant, because if we don't, um, we know one thing that um, the public service will not survive. And so for mm -hmm. us, we want to be able to be a part of the individuals who are going to be the mentors, the, going, the individuals who are going to be the the, the creative ones to show that, hey, we are going to do what we need to do to make um, put, putting persons in the right mindset, allowing persons to, to see what it takes to, uh, to make the public service run and, to, and, and to, to fulfill our respective roles in the public service. So I think it's all about, about that. Um, and then yeah. recognizing that we are team members. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, yeah. team members, team members. Yeah, and I, I was listening to a discussion by a, a thought, uh, opinion leader, a thought leader, whatever you want to phrase her as, a uh, pastor as well. Um, and she stated, what's one thing that you can change right now that could change everything? You could change the way you think. You could change, yes. you could decide to change the way you think about your yes. situation. Yes. So yeah, that's good. Mindset is important. So, what, so making these questions even more specific, why did you choose psychology as a field to major in? <laughs> why psychology? Uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, when I went to school, um, my best friend was a marketing major. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so uh, my first semester in college, I, I selected marketing as a major. However, I knew that I wanted to work in a field that deals with helping, working with people. And, and so I took a psychology class and I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started um, thinking about what kind of careers you can get with a um, with a degrees in psychology, and I I am so embarrassed to tell you how this one ended up, but I loved psycho I loved psychology, um, and it was a it it was a um, how I'd say um, a mind blowing experience. Um, it was a um, and so. In my freshman year, I decided, let me look at some of the majors. And I end up doing, uh, after that course, the second course, and, and I saw psychology being the greatest area for me. And so um, got into it, and I decided that I would pursue a PhD in psychology. Okay. But, but I didn't. Let me tell you what happened. I, I graduated from um college at the age of 22 and I was like oh man five more years in school I'll be 28 I'll be single no kids do I want to spend the rest five years in school um the biggest mistake for me and that's why I encourage young people to go after your dreams because on my 28th birthday I sat there and I was like wow I'm single no kids um and I should have pursued my PhD but um what I did was I still was in love with psychology. And so when I went to grad school, I decided to, um, to pick an area that I can work with my psychology. And, and I loved human resources. And so that's why I end up doing human resources at the graduate level. But yeah, it's all about helping people. Yeah. And you know, this is the thing, Mr. Joe, I would, I would say this, you know, getting a PhD is good. I'm in grad school now. Yes, it's nice and fine and dandy. But you know, the reality of the situation is having employable skills, having the capacity to change situations, to implement strategies, to work well in the environment, 
I think those translate equally as well as having a degree. A degree does provide job security. A PhD does yes. provide a lot of opportunity and leverage and social mobility and all those other things. And research shows that. But my yes. thing is, um, you can have a PhD and still not have the skills that you need for that particular niche. Yes. Yes. You can have a PhD in, so for example, you can have a PhD in some specific type of mass spec, mass spectrometry, which is a chemi chemistry technique. And you need to work in a particular area in the biological area, the yeah. jobs are available in the biological realm. So how, how do you connect those two? If you didn't get the employable skills, you have to do some more training then. Yes. Even with the PhD. So yeah. So, you know, I think it depends on your, your field. So, um, if you had to characterize what makes a successful public servant, what would you say? If someone's trying, if someone sees <laughs> Mr. DeVoe, listen to this episode, a Bahamian, American, whoever the case, because this these go all around the world. So um, yes. if someone listens to this episode and wants to be a public servant, a servant leader, what would you say makes a successful servant leader? Well, first of all, we all know that public servants work for the government and are there the citizens who make up um, working for them. But we want to know that we work for the elected government, not the political party. Mm -hmm. And so it's not. So when we come to work to the um, for the public service, we are not here to work because of uh, the politics. We are here to deliver a service for the government. We are here to inform and give policy making decisions. We are here to give the best evidence based advice to our leaders and has nothing to do about politics. It's, it's, it's doing, making sure that we're giving ethical, we're making sure we're giving um, uh, integrity in our um, development, in our, our thoughts. We're also ensuring that one, one of the things about it is that we are, I always say public servants are loyal to the government, not to whoever is in, but ensuring that, again, giving impartial advice, uh, objective advice. So the public servant knows that, hey, I am, I am working for the lead, for the, for the, for the country. And it's all about putting my country first. Um, and so I, I believe that's what we look at for a successful, for ideal public servant. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You work for, you work and you I respect the office, the institution. Yes. Yes. The procedures. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. So yeah. what ways can people contribute to the Bahamian Ministry of Education or Department of Education at this time? How can people contribute? If someone wants well, to say, I see the issue, I, or I see the Bahamian people struggling with this. Um, how can Bahamians or others contribute? Well, to well first of all, um, I would like, what I would love to see, mm -hmm. uh, David, is that one, our young people who are going um, and, and obtaining additional qualifications and, and uh, knowledge that they will return one day to come back to assist to build up our country mm. because all of the knowledge that uh, persons are receiving, mm. we also need to build up the Bahamas. Mm. So I'm hoping that we would see those individuals, like I have a daughter, as I said, she's, she, she did um, her bachelor's in elementary education or she's pursuing her master's in special ed and so I'm hoping that she would return back to the Bahamas knowing that um, she has a contribution to make mm -hmm. and, and, and and I'm hoping that the Bahamas also will be um, ensuring that they are going to make the environment attractive enough yeah. for our young people to return home yeah. and to make their contribution because we cannot be too afraid and and, and this is where we have problems. Um, our young people are getting the qualifications, but they're afraid to give them the advancement they need mm -hmm. because they say, well, they're too young. And so I'm hoping that we change our mindset too, um, mm -hmm. because um, you can't expect our young people to go off and be trained and you're not willing to um, embrace them. Mm -hmm. because you feel that they're too young and so that's a problem in the bahamas yeah i completely agree that 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 there's a there's a mindset shift that has to change yes the yes. mindset shift that has to yes. take place in that um you know a fresh perspective can yes. be good yes yeah novelty and novelty and naivety don't always go hand in hand <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so so just because someone's young doesn't mean that they don't have the capacity to make a substantial yes. change yeah and yeah so i completely agree with that um, so 
Do you have any advice to those wanting to pursue the field you are currently working in? Well, my advice to them is that one, you be open mind, you change that mindset. I, I want you to also to be, to be mindful of what it is that you want to do. Um, I'm so sorry, for, but for me, David, everything that I do is all about what legacy Ricardo Duvo is going to make, whether it's in private, public. Um, what is going to be the legacy? What is going to be something that I'm going to give to someone else? Um, it's all about mentoring. Mm -hmm. I believe that I am placed on earth to make someone else better than I was or mm -hmm. to make their road better than I was. So it's helping someone else, mentoring somebody, somebody else in this um, road called life. And yeah. so um, I'm here to, to, to offer myself so that the person who comes after me mm -hmm. um, doesn't have it as hard as I did. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree with you. You know, if I could help somebody as I travel along, yes. Yes. my living will not be in vain. And, you know, another thing is, um, I spoke with a professor from Harvard, Harvard University, Harvard and MIT. This is a co-director of the Health Sciences and Technology School. His name is Dr. Henry Brown. And one of the things he said, and this is not very, this is not a novel, but this is important. He said, if you can be nice to someone, why not do it? If you can yes. just be nice to someone, you're never too important to help someone or to reach out to someone. So I think that's right. very important. You're never too important. Never. Because, you know, God and Jesus Christ reached out to us. Yes. Yeah. So you're never too important. Um, so how, what has been some of the most beneficial advice you have received? Wow. Um, one is that, um, I, as I said earlier, um, having uh, plowed out of high school, I remember having um, my teachers and my parents tell me that, yes, I can. Um, and so uh, I, I think made that um, phrase so powerful. But I remember my parents telling me, Ricardo, you can move beyond this point. Um, I, 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 although you failed, I'm not giving up on you. You are my child, um, mm -hmm. you are my student, and you can do it, and mm -hmm. you will do it. Um, and so that's why for me, David, whenever I meet young people, I actually give them the, the tool of telling them, yes, they can. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can become whoever you want to become. Write it down, um, study it, review it, mm -hmm. and make it happen. Mm -hmm. I completely yeah. agree. Write the vision, make it plain so that they yes. run nothing. Do I tarry, do do. Yeah. Do I tarry, yeah. Wait for it. It'll surely come yeah. to pass. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. So, you know, I completely agree with that. And, you know, the thing I've come to understand is, yes, we recognize faith has its role in, like, religious circles, but faith also has a role in our vocational lives. Yes. Yes, it yeah. does. It has a su substantial role. So, you know, and I, I think um, as we conclude, one thing that's important is... Um, I think some things we can take away from this conversation is don't be persistent, persevere, yes. don't yes. give up, you know, and um, things are challenging, but, you know, hold fast to faith and hold fast to the people that are around you. Yes. And I think one of the things that we have come to understand is children, especially even in scientific circles, pediatric population is known that they have the capacity to be resilient. So things can change. Yes, things they can. can change. You just have to put in the work and trust God with the process. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. DeVoe. This is a really good Thank process. you, David. Thanks for listening. We're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is the new chemist where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I. Thank you.